everybody. Welcome to Zoom at 8. I appreciate so much that you make Tuesday the night that we get to visit with you, both learning and networking. This is what takes place on Zoom at 8. Again, my name is Julianne Peterson. I'm with Old Capital Lending. We are a premier provider of debt for multifamily, but we will also look at office, retail, you know, any industrial, anything in the commercial mortgages we'll take a look at. And so if you're working on something and you have a T12 and a rent roll and you're thinking, hey, I'm thinking about putting in an LOI, I'd love to look at that with you to give you kind of some high level um, and make sure that you have everything in, a, in place, whether it's your net worth, your liquidity, your experience. And if we need to bring in a sponsor or a property manager, somebody that can help you, that's what we do here at Zoom at 8. So we have taken down seven, seven deals so far here in Zoom at 8. We've been here for two years. And, you know, COVID did not stop a lot of people. If we had turned off our computers and didn't know that COVID was happening in the background, that's what we have experienced this past year with COVID. Not a lot of has changed this, and it is on fire. The industry is on fire. So, all right. Well, I think we are ready to roll. Um, we are ready to hear from Dave Sherbo. Now, Dave is, he is in a uh, hotel room. I understand that Dave spends a lot of time in hotel rooms because he has a lot of assets that he's managing across the nation. So if you're thinking about being an asset manager, be ready to be in some hotel rooms. But I wanted, I brought Dave on today because so many of us say, I can be an asset manager. I have taken care of my four single family homes. Uh, I'm, I'm now an expert. And when we're building our teams, we're always trying to figure out what is my superpower. And so what I think is super important is that we hear from a real asset manager, what does it take to, to, to really manage these deals? What is the responsibility of an asset manager? What kind of fees are they taking? And how do you find somebody like this guy, Dave Sherball? So Dave has an, an enormous amount. You can see this. He has a long resume of things, all right? He's, he lives in Coral Springs, Florida. Doesn't spend very much time there because he's taking care of other people's assets. But he is, uh, he's with Herschel Asset Management, although I think that that might not be true, Dave but um, you have a different C2G asset management. Um, and, and he's been managing for quite some time. And I, I wanna push it over to Dave because Dave knows much better about all of his uh, creative and all of his things that are, make him special and what he brings to uh, a transaction. So Dave, welcome to Zoom at eight. I'm so glad you're here. You're on mute. You're on mute. There you go. I am glad to be here uh, again. My name is Dave Sherbell, and my friends call me Sherby. So if anyone calls me, emails me, texts me, just just call me Sherby. Um, I've been in real estate for 31 years, um, always on the ownership side. In the beginning, I did everything from racetracks, marinas, multifamily, and still do some office and, and retail, but I oversee 5,300 apartment units across the country. Uh, my clients go from small local groups that have one deal to bigger groups that may have four or five deals. Um, you know, uh, my initial company is Heschel Asset Management. And I have some deals that I do asset management under that name. I partnered up with a gentleman out of Tampa Bay. His name is Clint Miller. And our company, c to g is Cradle to Grave Asset Management. We do anything from the due diligence to the capital transaction, whether that's a refi or a sell. Um, and I guess, you know, every company treats asset managers differently. But to me, I am the general manager putting together the team 
whether it's the property management, the lenders, the insurance, uh, the construction managers, the site teams, and I'm kind of managing the investment for each of you, the owners. Uh, I don't own a management company. Uh, I work currently with 10 different management companies. So I'm not getting paid by, I only get paid by you, the owner, and I only work for you, the owner. Uh, I don't get you know, any money from bringing anybody into the deal as far as vendors. Um, you know, I work on a lot of properties that, you know, were bought, they had good intentions, but they've gone off the tracks. Uh, I work with companies that may not be big enough to have, have an asset manager. So they hired me as a plug and play option uh, where I come on, kind of take over and, you know, make sure your game plan is being met. Um, a lot of my clients consider me like Yoda. I'm just a you know 30 year vet. I've messed things up at least once or twice, so you know I know what to look for and how to stay away from those uh, pitfalls. Uh, I only work with clients I like. Uh, my fees are very inexpensive, uh, and uh, you can call me at any time. Email me with questions. You know I don't charge. I always. We'll take your call. We'll call you back right away. My number is 954-646-7382. All right. Well, that was a huge amount of information that we want to unpack. So I want to, I, I have several questions and I would want to open this up to everybody. It's kind of an open forum tonight uh, because I think it's really important to understand what the heck does an asset manager really do? I see there's a fee. I see there's a 1% or 2% fee. Is that really how much you make on this every month is only one to 2%? Tell I, don't about char that. I don't charge a percentage. I just take a flat fee. And so if the property does better, I get my flat fee. If the property, you know, I'm not looking to share in your upside. I'm looking to make you your upside. And I like to stay on your deal for as long as possible. And you refer me to your next friend that, that's looking for it. So, yeah, you know, some of the asset management shops traditionally took the one or 2% of revenue. The institutional asset managers take a, base, a basis point on the total capitalized value of the investment, the debt and the equity. So those, those asset managers could be making, you know, on a $50 million deal, you know, 15 to 20,000 a month. So those are, you know, the more of the institutional great assets. Um, so it, it just really depends. So are you doing only institutional or would we be talking to you for five units or more? Uh, you know, typically, you know, it's a hundred units if it's 75 and you know, it's something that, you know, uh, you know, we can make work. Uh, so, you know, our, our fee, you know, if it's a one-off, we charge 2,500 a month plus travel. If you give us a few deals, it's 2000 a month plus travel. Our contracts are handshake. You don't like us. You just tell us to leave. We don't like you, you know, We'll stick around for a little bit, but we'll help you get to a point where, you know, then we can move on. So we try not to be uh, a burden on your operations, your cash flow. If the fee is high, some of my deals, I'll take back uh, some of the GP, you know, so that I have more skin in the game. Sometimes we'll, you know, push aside the fee if we see it's a growing business and take it on refi. Just depends on the deal, depends on the person kind of where you are in the cycle. So can anybody be an asset manager? And, and, and how did you get started being an asset manager? I mean, at what point did you say, this is my superpower? Um, I was in public accounting. I was an auditor, which is a good skill set to be an asset manager. Every, every firm is different. Bigger institutions, the asset managers visit the property twice a year. They do market studies. They do macro, macro level. Our firm is hands-on asset management where, you know, weekly, daily, monthly, we're on your asset. We're dealing with the management company. We're laying out the strategy. We're, you know, having the weekly leasing calls, the marketing calls, 
How are the work orders? Who's turning the units? We're really a hands-on to the management company to make sure that they're, you know, getting the goals that we're looking for. Um, so can anyone be an asset manager? Uh, I don't know. I mean, asset management, like I said, I'm the general manager, but it's my job to bring everyone together and have them all work and, or, you know, have the rows go together so that we're hitting the results. And sometimes tough decisions have to be made where you have to switch a management company, you have to switch a vendor, maybe someone on the staff is not pulling their weight. So, you know, we're a democracy, but we have the veto power. Uh, and so the, at the end of the day, the owner uh, is really the, the person that gets to make the decision. So as their agent, uh, I will sit with them, help them make a decision if they wanna be involved. Some of my owners just want to do due diligence and, uh, you know, equity raise, and they leave me to, you know, figure it all out. Um, some property management people will try to be asset managers, but their skill set may be more to a property management background, um, you know, which is a different side of the brain. Our job is to bring it all together and make sure your investment uh, is is met, and our our goals are aligned with the owners where even though Kimmer's on the phone, management companies, they're just taking a fee and whether it's three or 4%, it's not going to change that much. Uh, so if the property is staying full, but they're spending too much, it's not coming out of their pocket. So management companies alignment is much different than an asset manager's alignment. Could you really talk a little bit more about that alignment? Because there are property management companies that also do asset management, uh, that skill as well. Maybe they take on both. It, I think it is great to have them separated. Um, what are you, you're overseeing the property management company, correct? I hire them and I bring them on. Yep. Okay. And, and do you find that a lot of these new syndicators are not really familiar with what it takes from a property management side that you kind of hold their hands to explain, no, this is what a property management company does. I think that a lot of syndicators, at least what I have seen, they don't really know the scope uh, and the ability of the property management company, and they they have some unrealistic expectations of, of property management. And so property management has a tendency to get beaten up because uh, these guys just don't know what they're doing. So from an asset management, can you, do you help these young syndicators understand what the real capability and the, how, how a property management company can perform? So my last seven new assets are all from syndicators that, you know, they started out as students at, you know, one of the shops, uh, and then now these are their first deals. So they, they don't understand, look, how the seller should operate on a due diligence and a transition. They really don't know what property managements do and some of the work that they're taking on. The management company normally does it. It's not like an extra expense. Um, I think a lot of the syndicators that are out there, the people that are new, they get the broker's book. They listen and believe the, you know, the story that the broker has put in their book to sell it. And, you know, it's my job to point out that a lot of the stuff the brokers put in their book are just canned, you know, uh, bullet points. And some of them just never come to fruition. Some of their costs of rehab are nowhere near the real cost. Uh, and the management companies, you know, and, and by the way, uh, I've recommended Kimbra, Kimbra to some of my friends and, and they love her shop and I'm good friends with one of her people. So it, it's not a knock about management companies, but all management companies, they're average at best. Your job is to get the one that's better than average and owners will do better if they're more in tune and on their real estate. And if they actually understand what the management company does. So when they give you a response to a question, you could figure out whether it's true or not. So um, while you're all learning about how to buy deals and underwrite deals, 
the better you understand operations, the better you'll be as a underwriter and be a, a better owner. So, uh, yeah, I mean, so the broker, they're selling you the dream and then you'll never see them again until you want to sell it. They'll come back and visit you. The management companies are good, in my opinion, is if you give them a game plan and their job is to achieve the game plan. If you just hand the deal off to them and say, come up with the game plan, uh, a lot of the big shops don't do that. That's not their forte. Their forte is to take three, 4% off the, the revenues and charge a construction management fee. Most of them don't charge an asset management fee um, and, and any other type of billbacks. That's kind of how management companies make money. They're making it on your top line. They're not making it off your bottom line. You're the one that's stuck if they're just recarpeting every unit or overspending. So you got to pair up with someone that you really, really trust. And maybe they have some skin in the game with you as an LP. So if you're losing a little money, they're losing a little money. You're making money. They're making money. So I'm curious, Dave, when should somebody reach out to you? It sounds like you're putting deals with property managers. Would this be something that a syndicator, brand new, has a deal, finds a deal? Do they contact you first, then the property manager, and you help them underwrite their business plan? And then you say, hey, call Kimra, we'll work together with Kimra. And, and then the LOI, we're in it, we're um, at a PSA and we're, we're going, to, going to town. Can you kind of walk us through when does a, an asset manager, uh, when are they engaged? So, you know, if you have a management company that you have on existing deals and you're buying in the market and you like them, I'll work with them. Um, you know, if they're not doing the job, then you and I can have a discussion if you're going to a market, you're like, uh, Dave, I'm going to Dallas. Here's the deal. It's a C. It's in this part of Dallas. It's a little rough. Who do you know that could handle the rougher deals? And I'll give you a list, three or four, and we can interview them and talk to them. If you tell me, hey, Dave, it's a, a new deal or it's going to be a renovation to a nice new deal. Well, maybe it's a different you know, group of management companies. So at the end of the day, it's the owner's decision to pick who they choose. Uh, but I'll give them plenty of options. And again, I have no horse in the game. Uh, I'm not a management company, don't want to be a management company, but I can point out who is who is good and who is not. You know, my only advice is when you meet the owners of the management company, they all talk a good game. Interview the regional, go shop their other deals they have in the market, see if they're clean, see if the staff is friendly, see how those properties look. If their other properties don't look good and the customer service in the front door is not there, that's probably what you're going to get on your deal. Interesting. So I want to go back because I, I want to make sure that everybody's clear. They're underwriting a deal. They're brand new, yep. right? And they're looking at a deal. When do they call you, Dave? When do they call you to say, this is what I'm thinking. When do they get you involved in the underwriting and to say, yeah, I, I, I will do this for you. I mean, I would think that you're looking at deals and saying, yes, I can, I, I can work on this one or no, this is not something I want to get involved with. How do, you, how do you make that determination and when does somebody call you? Usually, look, you can call me anytime, but usually when you're in the best and final and you know that you're close mm -hmm. and you're trying to figure out how you're going, it's, you know, if you call me every time you do an underwriting model, you know, uh, that's a lot of underwriting models that people put out on a daily basis. Uh, you know, uh, I still have other clients, but, you know, you can call me and I just saw someone scroll 954-646-7382, anytime, seven days a week. So let's get that in the chat box because we're going to take the chat. So Angel, could you be so kind to um, put that in the chat box for everybody so that they have that? I missed right. it. Can I get a repeat? I got well, the first let's thing. get that going again. And we'll, we'll say it a couple more times. 954-646-7382. Okay, perfect. All right. I'm, I'm looking for what are some of the mistakes 
that you're seeing with the new people, new syndicators. I want two or three things that these people here today can learn from you. What are the mistakes that you're seeing that you could tell us about? Uh, due diligence, the lack thereof, or not focusing on the, some of the, the big ticket important stuff. So, you know, everyone does the lease audit, everyone does walks, the units. You need to know before you go hard, the roofs and the older properties, your big issues are going to be underground plumbing and your electrical wiring behind the walls. So you need to do not just bring out you need to bring out vendors, but you need to go check the work order log. You need to check the, you know, the detailed GL under uh, plumbing. Start pulling those bills, calling those vendors, kind of seeing what type of things are going wrong with the plumbing. Call the vendor. They'll, they'll tell you because they want to keep the business. Check the lines. If you find that they have a lot of mainline blockages or stack blockages, go spend some money in videotape lines. See what you have. Electrical wiring behind the wall. Look at the, you know, the stab locks. You know, are they old? See if they're aluminum wiring. A lot of people buy older properties. And if you can't see it, you just assume there's nothing wrong. But I have plenty of, you know, properties, especially in Texas, where, behind, you know, underground, there's just a lot of old piping, galvanized steel that just rots over time. And those are big expenses. Um, I would say... Don't trust the seller. Don't trust the broker. Get out there and, you know, do as much homework. Go to the local police station. Is there a crime issue? You know, go to the, the zoning board or the outstanding uh, code violations. Go through the detailed GL, call up vendors, see where they're booking the expenses. Are they putting it on the balance sheet? Should be on the P&L. Are they putting it below the line? Move it up. So I, I think before you go hard, you have to have vendors that will come out there and they'll come out there, get, get bids. Even if they're guesstimates, it's better than closing and finding out that you don't have bids or the broker gave you a number that wasn't the correct number. And it's the same thing for insurance. You, you just can't rely on other people's numbers because the seller will hide some numbers and the broker is certainly not going to highlight those either. So they're not your friend. They're just part of the equation to get the deal closed, but it's your job to figure out where the risks are. And once you figure out the risks, are you willing to live with those risks or is there a way to cure the risk? So, you know, it's not going to hurt you in the future because the worst thing to do is to have to call up your, your investors and say, we're doing a capital call. That's the second one. Nobody has enough working capital, especially when the lenders are not funding the lenders are sitting on the CapEx dollars, but they want you to lay out the money. And then you got to go find money to lay it out. And then they'll reimburse you. And there's a time effect. Raise extra money. Always have extra working capital for construction issues, operation issues, or things that you didn't think about during due diligence that you said, hey, yeah, we need new door locks on, on the units. You know, things do happen. Be prepared for it. Have that extra money around. Two. Don't be, so, don't be so aggressive to budget 95% because the first 60 days, all the deadbeats that the last person kept in there so that your lender is happy with you, you're going to probably have to go evict. Always underwrite something a little less. And it may not make your model work, but it's better not to do a bad deal than to do it. Um, I try to tell people do not do monthly distributions, but I know it's a big thing. The problem that you have is the vendors don't send the bills on time. The management don't get them in the system. You may release, dis, dis, distribute money, and then all of a sudden, two months worth of bills pop up, you know, and your investors are expecting it. Doing it quarterly from an administrative uh, perspective, there's less, you know, tasks that you have to handle. And quarterly, you get to kind of smooth out the expenses as they go. Um, I know it, it affects the yields, but it's better to, you know, be consistent than to have to play games and run payables up or cut construction because you're behind the eight ball. Dave, that was amazing information. I hope everybody took notes because that, that was like so, so many nuggets. 
Uh, Angel asks, how much extra or dollar amounts, what's the percentage that you would like to see extra? Um, maybe in, for, what it, in reference to what, Angel? Are you, you talking about for cash flow? Well, like, I think it, Brian says it better when he's like, recommendations for working capital dollars per unit. Like, Got how, it. how much extra? It depends on the deal. The bigger the construction budget, the bigger the, the reserve or call it contingency, just money that's there. Operations, I, I would always have at least one month worth of expenses because you're going to have some startup costs, things you didn't know you had to have, but just have enough so that when the first months of rents are coming in, you know, you have this extra money. You could always, as once you get stabilized and you can, you know, be consistent on the cash flow on a monthly basis, you could always distribute the money. You could always reallocate it for construction. But if you don't have it, it's tough to get it because your investors are already, you know, they've already given the money. Investors don't like to give back distributions. Yeah. And I guess, I guess third part is, be honest with your investors. It's better to tell them that there's a problem than not tell them a problem and they find out. They may not give you money going forward, but at least if you tell them on the street, you're always gonna be known as an honest person and people wanna do business with honest people. If you don't tell them there's a problem, then that's when people get pissed off and litigious. Always be, tr treat them like your family, tell them the truth. You know, you have to make sure that your investors understand that, you know, there are things that happen, uh, which leads me to number four, choose your partners and investors wisely. You can lose your spouse quicker and you can lose a partner. And I've seen lots of lawsuits. So when you do your raising of money, make sure it's people that have the same idea of what the goals are and how to get there. You don't want to be playing with fast money or people that are pains in the butts. Life is too short. To deal with pains in the butts. But, you know, if you have partners, have a prepackaged divorce agreement. So there's no fighting because when there's fighting, everything gets affected. Well, I think that there are so many of these groups that are getting together and they're getting together quickly, quickly, right? And they're not vetting each other. So they're, they're getting into a marriage that could last anywhere of five years to 10 years. And th those are critical relationships to the success of uh, these partnerships. Dave, you talked about some of these mistakes, right? You're brought in to help. How do you mitigate some of these? What, do you, 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 what is the most important of those mistakes that you need to get on right away um, that are, is like, okay, this is Right here is where you, um, there's failure and we're going to fix it. What, what would you say, um, these mistakes, like what is the top line uh, mistake that you're seeing? So if I'm brought on for a deal that's not operating properly by an owner, it's typically in attention to the day-to-day -day operations. Maybe the owner only has one deal in the city with the management company. The management company is big. Owner doesn't go visit the property enough. It's not on the phone calls. He's kind of turnkey everything over the management company. Well, management company knows that the site people don't think you care. So it's inattention to the day-to-day -day operation. So those are easy to correct because they go out there and, and you can see it. Uh, no one's checking to make sure the properties are clean. No one's making sure that the renewals are getting increases. If it's a syndicator that is also the management company and they have other you know, big investors and the management's not pulling their weight because I have a portfolio where, you know, we released the, the syndicators management company. And we brought on a third party. It's more about communication between the partners, communications, uh, you know, where the management company is, you know, using related entities to do unit turns or whatnot, but not disclosing it again. Just disclose everything. If you have a related business and the quality is the same and the price is the same or lower, disclose it to your partners. Because when you don't disclose it and they find out about it, especially if things are not going right, it just makes the situation worse. It's all about communications. If you don't communicate, that's when things go wrong. 
Dave, you're you're uh you're taking care of fifty three hundred units. As a an owner, how does how do they look at that? Do do owners say that's too many? You're not going to give my property enough attention, or is that more of, wow, this guy knows what he's doing. He can take on another thousand units. At, at what point um, does it does that hurt you, or does it help you on how many units that you're managing? So I I, I do have a partner. So he helps out on some of the deals. So I spread that. So typically my, my, my portfolio, some of these deals I've been on three, four years, they're running right. The clients just like me. I train their analysts, they become asset managers, and then I kind of go more to an advisory role. So it's like anything else. I have some really strong assets that I've been on and they're running like clockwork. Those, those are good. I have some that are new where a lot of the focus is on. And then I have some that, you know, I, I just kind of know what I have to do on a daily basis. Remember, every one of these deals has a property manager. And so, you know, I, I'm not playing property manager. I know enough to tell them when I know that they're not doing the right thing or, you know, I help them negotiate their service contracts, their turn vendors, I'll walk, you know, I'll do the pricing. So, with 30 years, I kind of know what's a symptom of, a, you know, of the, the cause or how to correct the cause so the symptoms go away. And yeah, there's things that you want it to be perfect, but you got to focus on the things that bring money into you know, the bank. Revenue is two times expenses. So you only can cut expenses so much and then you're raping the property. Really focus on the revenue because that's really what you know, generates the extra cash flow. So with 30 years, plus a partner, plus I do have some good management companies, you know, you know, it's not, it's not a a burden on my part. So if somebody were um, interviewing and for an asset manager for their team, what are some of the things that you would, we we would want to be asking an asset manager? What- How often do how often do you go to the properties? Huh? They tell you it's once every six months. And it's the same thing with the regional manager or property manager. The regional manager tells me they only go out once a month. You know, that's not the regional manager I want the management company to give me. I want them on the real estate weekly. Uh, I ask for, you know, what type of deals they've done. If it's anything that I can go shop, I'll go shop their properties. I'll see how they look just like I do the management company. I'll ask them, you know, what do they do weekly with the property? Are you doing the phone calls, leasing calls? Are you doing cash management where you're, you know, you're controlling which payables get paid because cash is, you know, it, it's not there. You can't cover the bills. Are you negotiating with vendors for discounts? Are you doing payment plans? Really, it's do you roll up your sleeves and do you do work or are you just really the straw boss that sits in an office? If they sit in an office and they're wearing a suit, it's not the person you want. You want someone that's wearing the jeans, rolling the sleeves up. And if someone's missing, they go out, they can go out and lease. I don't lease, but, uh, you know, I go shop all the comps myself. Uh, I do my, my own homework. Wow. That is great. Great information. Um, I'm, I'm curious, uh, managing different asset classes, you know, A, B, C, which ones do you like? Which ones do you dislike? Which ones would you want more in, in, to be brought to you? My portfolio is probably mostly C's and B's, a couple smatting or A's. You know, they all have issues. They all have a little bit different. You know, the older properties have repair and maintenance issues. Uh, the lower the rent structure, you may have some crime and demographic issues. So it's a different strategy about catching the people before they move in, that they gave you fraudulent pay stubs or they're criminals or, you know, the income levels are just not there. I try not to leave those decisions up to management about how much risk we want to take when a resident moves in. I like to set the risk parameters so that I rather keep the unit empty and clean than someone living in it, not paying and trashing the unit. It's not about physical occupancy, it's about economic occupancy. Mm. So, 
So the C-class takes a different type of, of a beast. Uh, the A's have a different type of a, a demographics that may be more demanding because they're residents by choice. They can go buy a house, they can go live elsewhere. You know, some of the C-class, their rent is by no choice, but you, you know, you, you gotta treat all your residents the same. Whatever they're spending, it's a lot of their salary, it's their home, they want the kids to be safe, they want the unit to be clean, and they want it to be priced right. So those are the three things I try to take. Um, it's all the same to me at a certain point in time. Cash in, cash out, treat them well. Do you spend more time on a C? And so the prices are higher or how, how does that work? So if you look at management companies, they, they make more money on A's because the fee structure is higher and they don't need to have, you know, the regional on more deals because the fee structure on a lower price deal, you need more deals to, to make the profit. Um, so that's why all the big players really like the A's because they can do better at a management company profitability. Uh, you know, New move-ins have different type of issues. You know, the unit's not perfect on move-in. You know, the resident's a doctor, educated, and they think that they know everything. Uh, mm -hmm. Their amenities are, have to be perfect to customer service. Um, you know, you're always trying to keep the unit new because once it's new, it turns old day one. You know, C-class asset, you know, you want to do the same customer service you want to do, it, but, you know, the residents know for the price point they're paying, the unit's not going to be perfect. They may have some, you know, 30 year, you know, wear and tear, you know, the walls and stuff. But again, they don't want to live with busted pipes. They don't want to live with roaches. You know, they don't want crime, you know, so it, it, it comes down to the same, but there are certain things about it that is a little bit different. Now, will you take every opportunity that's brought to you or are you no. sick? Okay. No. So tell us a little bit about that. If I, you know, I do my homework on clients. I know enough people. If I find that you're a difficult person to work for, you don't pay your bills. Um, you're a screamer, yeller, life's too short. Um, I, I won't take it. If it's something where, you know, the owner is kind of absentee, you know, I had a deal was 80 townhomes up in north of Palm Beach. And they only had a manager on the property. And I'm like, well, if she quits, I don't want to be the property manager. You know, it's not what I do. So, you know, I try to stay away from those situations. Um, you know, I'm looking for stable people. that want to have a good time. Don't take life too, too seriously. Because at 56, you know, I figured out that you spend more time at work. Work with people you like. Yeah, great, great thoughts. So a couple more questions. What do you do for fun? Um, I watch sports. My, my kids, I uh, hang with, even though they're out of college and, uh, just moved away. Uh, like movies, love dogs, hang with my dog all the time. Okay, good. So now those, now we're, you're very relatable with the dog. I, I must say everybody loves their dogs these days. Now, listen, I'm looking for words of wisdom. What, what kind of words of wisdom would you give somebody saying, I'm thinking about being an asset manager. What's your words of wisdom to them? Uh, go for it. But to be a good asset management uh, manager, you have to be a good property manager. You, you have to know what's going on at the property. So you got to, you know, and you have to know the construction side. You don't have to know everything, but when the construction manager gives you bids, are they bidding on the same scopes? Are they giving you two really bad bids so that their pick looks really good? So you got to not have to be an expert in anything, but you got to know enough in each category just to keep people honest. And if you can do yeah. that, then you'll, you'll be better uh, than average. And, you know, a mentor taught me early on, real estate is fraught with conflict. Everyone has a different, you know, way they're making money on a deal. You just have to you know, partner up with people where all the oars are going in the same direction. If you're making money, it's okay mm -hmm. if everyone else is making money. If they're making money and you're not, that's a problem. Say that one more time. The fraught, say, what did your mentor say? Real estate is fraught with conflict. Yeah. That means partnerships, you know, the day you started, you know, maybe the equity, they want to sell quickly where the 
syndicator wants to keep it for a longer term, you know, you know, maybe, you know, the management company, they're going in a different direction and they're not watching your bottom line. Maybe the construction guy is charging you more real estate. You know, it's where there's a lot of money to be made, you know, and hate to say it sometimes before you close the lender switches up and, you know, what they told you they were going to fund, you know, you may come up a million short. I've seen it happen. Um, not old capital. Not, not old capital. <laughs> but, you know, these no, things, I hear you. things happen. And again, the broker, they're not your friends. God, this Just is remember, bro brokers make, a, brokers make a lot of money when you buy and sell, but a lot of them don't own or take a piece in the deal. They just want to get it off the plate and they'll sell the story and they only need one buyer to come through the door and buy that, that hamburger. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Two last questions. One, um, books, education, what would your recommendation be for somebody that wants to learn more about this, uh, being an asset manager? Is there anything, any tools that you've that you've used, whether it's a book that talks about this or, Maybe you've already written one. I don't know. You know, so look, when I went to college, I never took a real estate class. I, I just never knew about it. I, I was lucky. I was in public accounting. I'm a CPA, non-practicing. But most people just read the financials. I go to the source documents so I can see the individual invoice. I can see what we're buying. Read financials. Ask for the detailed GL. Tell your management companies you want read at, read only access to the system, so you can double click on the financial the twelve hundred dollars of house cleaning. You can actually see the invoice. Are they charging you for extra dirty? Are they giving you a credit for extra clean? Is the painter painting every ceiling? Does every ceiling? Figure out what makes it to the financials because the one number on each line can be made up of twenty or thirty. Just spend some time looking at the detail. And just treat it like your home budget. Well, should I be buying this? Do we need a GE or do we need a hot point? Where am I getting the best return? Why am I using, you know, a 25 ounce ca carpet? You know, do I need that high grade? Do I have the right pad, you know, for wear and tear? Don't just rely on the financials. Go to the source document. Look at the stuff on the balance sheet. So you don't have to be an accountant to understand it. Just read it, and if you have questions or you want to go through a financial with me, just ask, uh, and we can go through a financial. And that means oh. reading the that means reading the balance sheet also. Fantastic. T twelves, T twelves are important. Budgets are just the roadmap. Look at the T twelve so you can see growth What's happened. month month over month. Yeah, fantastic, John. I haven't forgotten about you. He wants to know if you get involved with heavy CapEx proper, uh, projects and I what do. is in what role do you do? So, you know, as part of the asset management, sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll help him design the clubhouse. I'll help him pick the upgrades for the unit. Uh, I'll, you know, I try not to do paint colors, but so traditionally I have construction managers that I hire, same couple guys. They go across the country. They do all my deals. They're very inexpensive. They're cheaper than the management companies, um, but the lenders love them. They're honest and, and that, that's all they do. So typically a lot of management companies want to do construction management, but when they mess it up, you usually fire the property side. Um, so I will do as much as you need. Um, you know, again, my guys, gals, they'll write the scopes. You don't leave it up to the vendors to write the scopes because they'll overwrite the scope so they make more money. Um, you know, try to make it apples to apples. Um, but yeah, I get involved in, in, in the construction. I can tell you that you need a seal coat, you need an overlay. You know, I know understand the basics of roofs, why, you know, if your whole period is five, seven years, you don't need a 25-year warranty. You know, I, I know enough of how to put the lipstick on the pig to get you through a sale. Fantastic. My goodness. Dave, you are an amazing wealth of information for our audience here and just have created so much um, information and knowledge for them. I, I want to thank you for that. Um, no, thank let, you. Yeah. Let's, let's open it up. Is there anybody else 
Uh, anybody else have a question if you wanted to raise your hand? Otherwise, we're going to get to, um, let's see, Chris, do you have a I question? Do. Oh, yes, I, I bet you do. Tell yeah. us. So, hey, Dave, really appreciate your insight. You, you described a lot of my nightmares already. Mm -hmm. So how do you cap, what do you look for in the financials? Because some of the things that I've seen property management company do is they don't even upload the invoice onto the system, right? right. So when you catch something, you don't, it's not there. And then when you're, they're doing the bids, right? How do you know that they're not giving away the price so that you don't end up with a $5,000 and $4,500,000 and a $5,200? They're all the same prices. Right. So I had a management company that we were using their construction manager, uh, a new syndicator, and the parking lot uh, vendor gave a bid for 100000 right on the dot. And I'm like, gee, that's our budget number. So I brought my construction manager in. I said, I bet you the management company gave their vendor the bid because they were the winner. And we called the same vendor and we happened to know her. And she's like, yeah, they just told us to give $100,000. So, you know, sometimes when you get the bids, you just pick up the phone and call the bidder and kind of ask, you know, how they came up with their number. Uh, sometimes I bring in bidders just to keep the management company, if we're using their construction management company, honest. Uh, sometimes I'll ask questions and sometimes I, I just know kind of what things cost. So I can call around to different people that I know in the business and say, hey, did you do recently do a roof in this market? You know, kind of what you paid. A lot of it's just word of mouth and, you know, who do you trust? Remember, a lot of times when the construction managers get let go by the management company, if they go to work for the vendors, that means they've been on the take. Man, oh, man. Great, great information. Wait, Dave, repeat that last part again. Say what? I Lots of times the management companies, the bigger ones, if, you, if their construction manager gets fired and they, they wind up at the vendor of choice of the management company, my gut is that they've been on the take. Got it. Thank you. Now, as, far as, the, yep. as far as AP, first, first rule is tell the management company, no, no, no drawers, glass top desk. You can't hide bills in the desk if there's no drawers and you can see in. Uh, number two is I get an AP run every week, plus I get the cash reports, and you kind of know how your expenses. So if you see financials where you have an expense, then you get a couple zeros, then you see two months, you know, especially around the quarter that the staff gets their bonuses, you just have to have a little talk that bills have to be put in the system timely because it's affecting your distributions, and you just have to watch it. Or you can go to a third-party system like an Avid Exchange where the vendors scan the bills directly to this company. The management company gets an email to approve the bill, but the bill gets paid, uh, you know, so the bills don't get lost. Typically that's what happens when properties aren't operating and the managers aren't meeting their budget and they're not gonna hit their bonus. That's when bills get hidden where they don't get booked. Can you put the website on the chat please, Dave? Abit Exchange? Yeah, I mean, I've used them in the past. Uh, if you call Kimra, I'm sure she may know a couple of firms that do the same thing. Kimber, Kimber runs a management company, a big one. Uh, she's a good resource on anything. And I'll send you, you know, names and numbers, but it's called AVID, A-V-I-D Exchange. Fantastic. Yeah, put the invoice, uh, invoicing from the vendors in their hands directly to the where the where the money comes out, so that it, we, we remove all invoicing out of the hands of the onsite team. Um, they're they're responsible to validate, but they are not. Um, there's no more hiding invoices in the in their desk drawers. That just cannot happen. Um, like the way we the way we operate. And also, next time you go here. when you go visit your property, go sit in the manager's chair and open her drawers. If you see Always. bills, Always. you'll you'll know you'll know they're hiding bills. That's right. Always, uh, that's regional manager inspection, a uh, VP inspection. Everybody's told open those desk drawers. Mm -hmm. So just remember, great stuff. The, the the good vendors 
will put a lien or sue you. It's the vendors that don't, but all of a sudden they pop up these bills and they haven't done anything. That's where the manager probably has a relationship with that, with that vendor. That's fantastic. My gosh, you guys, I want to thank you, Dave, just a wealth of knowledge and super excited to be able to share you with all of our people here at Zoom at 8. 